Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with health, performance, and how to elevate the human experience. I explore the latest tools, science, and technology with experts in various fields of human optimization. This is your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Superhumans. This is a Decoding Superhuman first. Today, we have, as a guest on the show, Republican primary presidential candidate Zoltan Istvan. Zoltan is a philosopher, journalist, and number one best-selling author of The Transhumanist Wager. And I wanted him to come on the show to talk a lot about that latter topic, transhumanism. If you think for a second that the podcast is getting political, let me stop you right there. Zoltan is a wealth of information on the transhumanist movement, which is something that we really haven't explored on this podcast. So what did we get into? We went into near-death experiences, Zoltan's experience running through landmines, but also volcanic boarding of all things, what it's like to travel for National Geographic to over 100 different locations around the world. And then we get into the future of work, AI, and of course, why that may be a very scary thing for most people. What I like most about this conversation is that Zoltan is bringing some questions that really need to be asked at a political level to the forefront. Specifically, what do we do about technologies like CRISPR, AI, et cetera? You can find the show notes to this one at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Zoltan and enjoy this episode with Republican presidential candidate Zoltan Istvan. This is a Decoding Superhuman first. We have a, a presidential candidate on the show today. Zoltan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, you know, like I said, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time for a multitude of reasons. And really because, um, I, let's just get started with your background, because there's some crazy things that you've done in this life. And I, I just want to ask you a little bit about some of your travel experiences when you were younger. Uh, when you were 21, how many countries did you go to? So, you know, I had the luck of uh, buying a very small sailboat, a uh, 25-footer, when I was, um, you know, 21 years old and then left. And I sailed uh, through the South Pacific for four years and then across the Indian Ocean, up the Red Sea and into the Mediterranean. And over a seven-year period, I really explored a ton of countries. And towards the end of that, I began also working uh, for the National Geographic channel using my sailboat as kind of a base to explore different stories. So I've now explored over 100 countries um, and a lot of that during that initial sail trip in my 20s. Were you solo or were you kind of traveling with somebody the whole time? So, you know, the first four years were uh, basically solo. uh, And then I began to bring on girlfriends. So some girlfriends would stay for six (laughs) months or a year. And so I had a number of different girlfriends. But, uh, you know, in the end of the seven years, about 80% 80% of the trip was solo. Mm-hmm. That seems like a, a fantastic trip. Now, one of the things I was reading about you and your background with National Geographic was the idea of, of volcano boarding. And you've explored this a little bit more than, frankly, I have not explored it. I've done sandboarding in Namibia, which I thought was very cool. But what got you interested in volcano boarding? So, you know, in what happened is in 1995, when I was sail- on this trip, I sailed by this uh, this wonderful country called Vanuatu. But in this island of Tana, there's a volcano like that's constantly exploding. It's one of the world's most photographic volcanoes because it's constantly shooting up stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, But when you see the volcano, you say, oh, my God, it's a perfect slope. It's like 2,000 feet up there, and it's just pure sand. Uh, of course, upon closer inspection, there are a lot of like lava bombs and things like that. But from a distance, <laughs> it looks like the perfect slope. Yeah. So um, later when I was working uh, for National Geographic in 2000, uh, actually 2002, I think I, I remembered the story, pitched the story, brought my snowboard to this place and did one of my very first National Geographic story, uh, channel stories, TV stories for them on this subject. And of course, this is the very first time volcano surfing or volcano boarding had really been launched formally, mm-hmm. um, at least caught on camera. And the sport was discussed and national, and it kind of went viral, this video. So everyone started talking about it. Of course, 
you know, it's not that different than sandboarding going down pumice. Pumice is just what volcanoes shoot up. It's kind of this ash. It turns into something very flaky, sort of like snow, except it's warm. And the only difference with volcano boarding is in this volcano, particular volcano, there's a bunch of things flying over you, what we call lava bombs. And your goal is to get to the bottom really quickly without being hit. And, you know, there's a couple of grave sites on this volcano from just people that go up and look because people have been killed. They get hit by these rocks coming out and they're just mm -hmm. like, they go right through you. And um, so it's, it's scary. And, uh, but you know, that said, this is how, how the sport launched. And now there's like six or seven volcanoes around the world that actually volcano boarding takes place on. Some are active, some are not, but you know, it, it, it's grown into a bigger sport. So point of clarification here, what the hell is a lava bomb? So when, you know, a lava bomb is, you know, when molten lava gets spewed out of the volcanoes, okay. that's what turns into the hard rock. But when it comes out, it just looks like, you know, this big piece of kind of liquid metal or liquid rock. And um, you have to watch those out. Now, at nighttime, or at least at dusk, that's the safest time to do the volcano mm -hmm. boarding because you can see them glowing in the sky. In the daytime, it's actually very difficult because you can't really see them and they just kind of like plop down. And of course, sometimes they're the size of a Volkswagen. Other times wow. they're just the size of a tiny rock. But either way, they're burning. So if they go right through, they go right through because they're so hot. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's how people have died. And, of course, you have to understand, this is a volcano very far away from anything. There's yep. no hot – I don't even know if there's a hospital on the island. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're in trouble if anything happens. That's crazy. <laughs> and so I'm starting to see a, a kind of a theme. And I want to get to transhumanism here in a second. But uh, along this trip, you had experiences in Yemen, sounds like Vanuatu as well as well as Vietnam, that were quote-unquote near-death experiences. Can we walk through some of those and sort of how that shaped you into really becoming interested in transhumanism? Well, yeah, I think what happened is I've just, um, you know, through these adventures, you have a bunch of near-death experiences or at least very close to death experiences. Like, you know, I had a, this pirate attack situation off, uh, off Yemen where um, – and this is one of the times I had my a girlfriend with me, and I, I knew that some boat was approaching us. And if you get approached, we were seven miles off the coast. You get you hear an engine off the coast of the Amen, where there are a ton of pirate attacks. You know something is not right is happening. But so I hid my girlfriend like deep into the boat, and then I waited. And then this boat showed up that was actually longer than my boat because I had a small boat, and these four guys were like masked with machine guns, and I think. I, on my sailboat, I have this thing called a radar detector, which is this like little uh, metal thing that makes you look like a big ship. That's what it does <laughs> on radars. So they must, this is, must have been like the Yemeni Navy or whatever. <clears throat> and these were like pirates. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't matter really if you're, if you're in the military and you go out to take money from somebody, even if you're in the military, you're a pirate. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, these guys came out and thinking I was probably picking me up on radar, thinking I was a big ship we're really kind of disappointed to find out I was this tiny little, you know, guy floating. So they, they just said, Oh, they were kind of like, they pulled up, they tied up my boat, they pointed their guns, but they were a little bit confused that I was this small, tiny boat, even smaller than theirs. Like, you know, why are we pirating this guy? But you know, despite that I was smart enough to know right away, I had money. I just handed them that they could see a bunch of jerry cans of gasoline. They took that. I had a little bit of booze, uh, even though they're probably Arabic, they still took that. Mm -hmm. And um, and we also had a ton of cigarettes that we used in terms of trading. So I gave them all that. And they just like kind of pushed off and just said, and then drove off. And that was it, you know. And it, it was um, it was really weird because there was no language. You know, I couldn't understand yay many. But you understand when men have machine guns pointed at you. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so it, it was it was a terrible experience. Um, a little bit funny in a way as well, because like I said, I think they were expecting a major ship to do a, a full pirate attack on. That's why they're all dressed up and ready to go. And all of a sudden, they find this little tiny yacht. Uh, you know, it, it looks like a little teapot. And they're probably like, who's this crazy guy sailing across the world in this little 25-foot boat? Who would do that? Mm -hmm. and, and so similar situation in Vietnam. You almost stepped on a landmine. And I've, I've done the Vietnam sort of jungle. It, it could get pretty thick right? You not know where you're stepping, etc. Talk us through that, because I've heard that that helped shape really what your experiences and your interest in transhumanism, because I, I would love to see just why you connected so well with transhumanism. Well, 
you know, the, the thing with the amen is that when the pirate thing happened, it was like two or three minutes of complete, ah, you know, and you, you don't really know how to think because people got guns pointed at you. So you don't yeah. have time to think. You're just kind of react. Vietnam was, I was covering a story for National Geographic on bomb diggers. There are, you know, we Americans dropped massive amounts of bombs in Vietnam. About 10 or 15% of those bombs never exploded because that's just the kind of the fail rate. And if you dig up a six foot bomb, that's like, you know, so huge and you can dismantle it, you can sell the metal for like a thousand dollars. Now, the people that are selling this metal are usually farmers who make a dollar a day. So if you find one bomb, you can make like a year's supply of farming. So as a result, there's this natural tendency for younger males in Vietnam specifically to go out with the shovels instead of farming and to dig for these bombs, hoping yeah. they find unexploded bombs. So I was covering this story for National Geographic and I was covering it for about five or six days. And the thing about it is you're in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, you know it's filled with you know it's filled with landmines, you know it's filled with unexploded bombs, and it's nerve-wracking. It just gets in your brain like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get killed here. Yeah. And, and then of course you're in and for my story, all I did was interview landmine victims because the people that end up digging for these bombs, they rarely get hurt by the bombs. They get hurt by the landmines in the search for the bombs. Mm -hmm. So that was that whole story. And then we came to a point when they were um, you know. We saw something in the ground. They saw something in the ground that I hadn't, because here I am carrying around the camera and all this. And one of the guys sort of pushed me out of the way and said, look, this is probably something. And we started looking very carefully. And indeed, it was a landmine that had I, you know, taken maybe another step, I probably would have, I could have potentially stepped on it and exploded. But after six days of freaking out and also after covering other conflict zones, this was the moment in my mind as a journalist where I kind of broke down and I said, you know what? I'm sort of done with being a war zone and conflict person, con you know, correspondent. I'm kind of done. I need to go back to the States because when you cover this kind of stuff, you, it gets in your head, you get PTSD. There's all these yeah. other things. And it was that night in my hotel that I said, you know, maybe I should do something with my life dedicated to overcoming death, not necessarily covering it in terms of what I was covering in war zones and these conflict areas. And, um, and that's really when the transhumanism thing got into my brain and the next day, I started looking into it, what was out there, and lo and behold, there's an entire movement that's out there dedicated to trying to overcome death with science and technology. And that instant with the, with the landmine where the guy pushed me out of the way was really the core part of that decision to go. Just after that, I was sold on, this is what I want to do with my life. I don't want to film these. One these stories are wonderful, but they're dangerous. I mean, I was going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And... It just because this is the first episode where we're really diving into transhumanism, there's a few pieces that we probably need to lay out here. Uh, first, your own definition of transhumanism, but also just uh, when you're looking at uh, when you were investigating transhumanism, because you come from that background of, um, in a way, that conflict journalism, how did you start investigating it? Well, so first off, I'd kind of known about transhumanists because I'd been a science fiction geek and mm -hmm. I studied at university and all these other things. I just didn't realize that I could maybe do something with my life that was not journalism, you know, inspired and actually join it. Like, how do you join a social movement? Like the, the, the example for your listeners, it might be like, well, how would you join the environmental movement? Are there groups that you could do? Are there studies? Would you do maybe a PhD in environmental studies? Well, all of a sudden, when I decided I want to go into it, I was like, well, wait a sec, how do I do it? And in my case, I decided to write a book because I always had wanted to write a book and mm -hmm. that was named The Transhumanist Wager. And I was quite lucky after four years of writing it that the book took off, became a bestseller in science fiction and things like that and launched my career into the public sphere of transhumanism. But just so your listeners really know, I mean, a technical definition of transhumanism would be that it's a kind of a, a multi-million person social movement around the world of people that want to use science and technology to radically modify the human being and modify the human body it can be anything from exoskeleton suits or brain implants or even simpler things like uh, driver's cars or maybe genetic editing. I have friends that want to grow eyeballs on the back of their head because mm -hmm. they think that that's something that we need when we were, you know, evolution would have thought we were running away from a cheetah. We should have had an eyeball on the back of our head. So we have people that are trying to use genetic editing to now do that. 
That's mm-hmm. kind of what transhumanism is. Mm-hmm. And so we've had the like, people, for instance, Dr. Aubrey de Grey has been on the show before. And he has, uh, just to kind of delineate the two, he has a movement on more on the anti-aging side of things. Transhumanism, are we f- referring more towards uh, almost self-cyborging or is there an overlap between the two? Well, I would say there's a huge overlap. So during my uh, former presidential campaign in 2016, uh, Aubrey de Grey was my longevity advisor. So, you know, uh, he's a great guy. But you're right. He is dedicated strictly to anti-aging stuff, whereas Mm -hmm. I am uh, much more catering, I I suppose, to a younger crowd. You know, it's funny. The the anti-aging battle is often determined by uh, age groups. You know, younger people don't want to, um, y- younger people don't worry about dying and older people do. And so that's kind of this big problem that we often have mm-hmm. with, you know, the, the transhumanism movement is it's hard to get young people interested in life extension technology. So ultimately, what's happened is transhumanism has become this kind of um, movement that really is about merging people with machines without necessarily living forever aspect to it. However, I'm, I'm middle-aged, man. I'm not so young anymore. I'm 46, so I really do want to uh, live um, <laughs> forever. So I, I tend to side very often with Aubrey on his ideas, and I would like to move transhumanism, transhumanism more towards this idea of, of not just merging with machines and having fun as a cyborg and experimenting with ourselves, but also to not dying. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so many points of gratitude towards you for having a longevity advisor in politics in a day and an age when I'm not sure many politicians do. Uh, So let's talk about some of these technologies and some of these, I guess, pieces of technology that you've seen not only in um, kind of the human augmentation realm, but also in that path to living forever. What have you seen that's very promising in sort of that merger between man and machine? Well, you know, I think the the one technology that a lot of people um, are excited about and I'm most excited about is really the brain implant technology. So, you know, we have a couple of different companies now, like Elon Musk has one called Neuralink and Brian Johnson has one at Kernel. They're all in California and people are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into this technology so that we can interface um, in real time with a machine uh, to give you an idea and ideas. And maybe 10 years time, you and I would be able to do uh, this podcast just in our brains. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, maybe it's not going to be 10 years, maybe it'll be 20 years, but there's no question at some point, this podcast will be able to be just done in our head. And once that kind of thing happens, that's going to be incredible in terms of work and trading stocks and Google mapping, because it's all in your brain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea is to try to take a cell phone and put it into here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why have it on the outside when you can have it inside your body? And that's really one of the most amazing transhumanist technologies right now that's going forward. And there's just been an amazing amount of outreach and and, and work in terms of how far, I mean, they're doing drone races with mind reading headsets in Florida, Mm -hmm. just using this type of, you know, uh, technology, brainwave technology. And how far does it go? You know, that's the question. And just, you know, from a workforce and, you know, point of view, it's, they're starting to lay off a ton of mid-level traders that are, you know, in, in the stock market and the New York Stock Exchange, things like that, because AI is able to trade just yeah. as equally. But how can we keep these jobs? Well, a lot of people like Elon Musk would say, well, we keep these jobs by having machine interface in real time in our brains. Mm-hmm. And that way we don't need to fire people because they're just as good as the machine. And whether that's true or not is a hard case to make right now, but Certainly, there's no question that if you can interface with the machine, you're going to be quicker in making decisions, and that could save capitalism from this onslaught of automation that's sort of inevitable at some point. So let's go into that, because uh, one of your criticisms of this race to the singularity, or not really criticism, but one of the things that you've talked about as sort of a potential for opposition on the path to singularity is AI. And it's also something that I do think about as well. Like Skynet, for instance, just to look directly at Terminator there. Uh, How do you foresee, uh, is it simply Neuralink and those types of companies that prevent us from going, um, you know, getting decimated by AI, or is there something else that we're missing right now that needs to be addressed? 
All right. The sponsor for today's podcast is a member of the toolkit that I use on an almost daily basis to upgrade my state of being and have used it actually for the past couple of years. The guys over at Neurohacker Collective have done a fantastic job. You've heard me rave about the original stack as well as Qualia Mind on the show. But now I'm so excited because the suite of products has grown. You have Qualia Focus for that near term bump. You have Qualia Mind Caffeine Free for all my caffeine sensitive listeners out there. But their latest product, which just came out, is oh so exciting. It's called Eternus, and it's a 38 ingredient formula containing the most researched and premium ingredients on earth for supporting cellular health. This is key to combating the symptoms of aging. If you want to check out Eternus, Qualia Mind, Focus, or any of the Neurohacker products, go over to neurohacker.com and plug in the code BOOMER. You'll get an additional 15% off your order. Enjoy. Well, I mean, I would say, in you know, despite being a libertarian-minded person, I would say this is probably one of the few times we're really going to need some government intervention yeah. and government oversight because, you know, you you brought it up. I mean, Terminator is a great movie, but it's also the the right way to look at this in many ways. You know, we have a fifty-fifty chance of a robot that's as smart as us um, being nice to us or not being nice to us, mm-hmm. and if it's not. If it's smarter than us and it's not nice to us, it could be the end of humanity. So, or at least a big challenge for humanity. So, we need to, in many ways, I say, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, improve the situation so that bad things don't happen from AI. And that means some type of oversight on companies like Google that might be doing it or working with Google. I don't want to say oversight, but the military can work with these companies that are working on stuff. I mean, you have quantum computing coming through the pipeline right now, too. These are all going to advance AI immeasurably. You know, it, it, it's we coming to an era where this is a global security issue mm-hmm. to have an AI be able to turn off all the power grids on planet Earth at once. We could be sent to the dark ages. I think governments need to be involved. I think we need leaders involved. So uh, let, let's dive ahead first in this because you struck um, somewhat of a pain point with me and when it comes to... On an international level right now, there are many discussions not being had. Uh, AI is one of them. CRISPR is one of them. Uh, blockchain, I guess they're just afraid that it'll take over their jobs. But how come we are not having these conversations on an international regulatory level, let alone the United States? Well, I'll tell you why. Simply, it's like you would think that AI, as Putin has said, Vladimir Putin said this, you know, whoever runs the AI age runs the world. Yeah. You would think this is the most important national security issue. You would have thought between Trump and Hillary during the last debates or even the Democratic debates, we would be talking about this. The problem is as soon as you start talking about this stuff to the average person, they think, oh, this is too weird or this guy's kooky or, and they lose votes. Mm-hmm. It, it's not beneficial for a mainstream politician to talk about these so-called sci-fi ideas, even if they're here in reality, because They're not good talking points. It's not like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to make you pay lower taxes or you're going to get better health insurance. Everyone's like, yeah, 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 AI, you know, blah, blah, blah. Despite that, we know from history that scientific progress is often the most important, you know, stimulus for, you know, what happens in the world. And genetic editing and AI are easily the two most important topics, I'd say, right now, I think, in the world. You know, maybe there's environmental crisis as well, but there's a good chance that both those types of science fields can also help the environmental crisis. But nobody talks about it because it doesn't win votes. In fact, it often loses votes in the polls. So the main politicians don't talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. So is it because the politicians, I guess it's kind of the dog wags the tail here a little bit too, but is it because the politicians don't understand it or is it because mainstream doesn't understand it and is terrified by it and wants to push it underneath the rug? Well, I, I think it's probably a combination of both. It's hard mm-hmm. for me to imagine. You know, I'm not sure how Trump is at emailing and using <laughs> smartphones and things like that. He's really good uh, at Twitter. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you know, so we we don't we don't know his expertise in terms of using these types of devices mm-hmm. and feeling comfortable. I think, like you and I, to get on Skype or to get on Zoom and whatever, you know, and, and just we can figure it out very quickly. Um, and so. How much more so is an AI an issue for these people who are trying to say, wait, a a robot is going to take over the military and bomb? That's great. You know, 
that's kind of the reaction. And I think that reaction is quite similar with the majority of Americans and the majority of people in the West who are also not necessarily interested. You know, my mom, for example, would be like, she hears AI and it sounds like some thing she reminds, reminds you know, from the movie, some science fiction movie she saw 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that that's not what it is in Silicon Valley, where I know that there are thousands and thousands of engineers driving to their job every single day to work on the new coding for an AI that might one day run the country mm -hmm. or control nuclear weapons or things like that. And so, um, you know, I'm here in ground zero in terms of a lot of this technology and this is the real world. This is what pushes it forward. But I don't know how to convince mainstream people or politicians to be interested in this. It just seems like it's a taboo subject. Mm. In terms of just like there needs to be almost a behavior change among society, right? And how we look at these things. And I guess, you know, some of the work of people like Buckminster Fuller and a few others come to mind. Like we're exponentially increasing the amount of people that have their finger on the button to Pandora's box, but our intelligence is not exponentially increasing. How do you like how do you even begin to solve that problem? Well, you know, to begin with, I think the best thing people can do <laughs> is try to have a lot of scientists and engineers run for office. And of mm -hmm. course, that's sort of my big calling, too, is I'm running, trying to toot my horn and say, look, why isn't science at the forefront of any kind of presidential campaign mm -hmm. or any kind of congressional campaign or whatever it is? So I do think when you talk about politics, we just need to embrace it. It's just from a historical point of view, it's like, like I said, nothing really moves the world as much as science and certain technology. I mean, think what the internet did to the world. Mm -hmm. So we just need to get people to embrace that and understand it from a historic point of view, how important it is. But it might take something more dangerous. It might take something like North Korea saying, oh, it's not that we have the bomb. We have the AI. And all of a sudden they send a virus that wipes out all of the CIA's databases. That would be a message. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, the, that's a, the, the problem is that's now it's almost like some cyber war. And we need to, that might be what happens in order for our country and our military to have a wake up call that this is the new frontier. This is where our resources have to be spent. And unfortunately, then the people would fall, then congrats, you know, Congress and senators and whatnot, everybody would say, okay, let's, let's, let's spend some money on this. Let's take this seriously. But right now it's just not a good talking point. It just loses voters. Mm -hmm. um, is there anybody out there doing it right, right now? in terms of countries? Well, you know, I, I'm a, a fan of at least Andrew Yang um, talking about these things as a Democratic candidate. And um, so that, that's been good. At least he's bringing up some of these issues that are new. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, he's really only being heard by millennials and millennials don't need that much interaction with these ideas. I mean, it's, you know, these are millennial ideas. Millennials all know what AI, they're all interested in future. They're all interested in genetic editing. These are not the, the, the generation that's pushing this aside. Yeah. The generations that's pushing these ideas aside are the older ones beyond even Gen X, the boomers, like people like my mom who are just like, well, I, I, you know, I, I'm just worried about social security, you know, instead of like how these kind of genetic editing might affect the entire planet and a new kind of breed or race of people or something like that. And, you know, so the way to talk to people about it is, is unfortunately, I haven't discovered the magic yet to it. Mm -hmm. I do my best to, and I'm not sure how many other people are doing it because, you know, I'm not going to win any campaigns talking about that. And that's kind of one of the big problems here is until I can win a campaign on this, I'm not sure how far this message actually goes. So I guess let's, let's play a little game of tennis here and just volley a couple of ideas, if you don't mind. Uh, on the future of work, how do you just calm people so that they realize that this stuff needs to be talked about? It's not necessarily scary, and you should embrace it rather than run from it and fight it. Well, uh, you know, I try to tell people that governments will have to implement a universal basic income at mm -hmm. some point. And I'm a fan of universal basic income. And I think that's really the only way to address automation at this point. I mean, okay, you know, maybe we can merge our brains with robots and then compete against them. But even that probably doesn't last long. I just think at some point, 20, 30, 40 years, robots are just better and smarter than us at everything. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about this, though, is that it doesn't mean that robots will take over the world. It might mean that the human race can live in some kind of 
automated luxury communism, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, not that I'm necessarily a fan of any of that, but it is the idea that maybe nobody works. Everybody is just an artist. Everybody does what they want. If you've seen the cartoon Wally, -E, maybe we just float around as large <laughs> entities and, and, you know, relax all day and enjoy our basic income. That could very well be the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a good one because, you know, I, I maybe people, some people get five PhDs, but probably most people just watch sitcoms all day. Well, this, and, you is know, why, I, this would be like a great excuse to buy Netflix, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, of course. So, and I, so I worry, but I do think that luxury is something that the human race is going towards. Mm -hmm. And I do think robots will do many more jobs in the future, including having robots in our house, houses that make us lazier and uh, life easier. Again, I don't know if we get lazier. Maybe we'll, you know, recoup and do some as a, as a species and, you know, find art and do other things that are really do podcasts all day long. You know, I mean, yeah. amazing things, you know, and, and spread knowledge, but you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, most people that get a day off work don't, don't often spend it doing the most productive things. However, maybe that's because they've been working so hard, but the future is probably not working and robots doing everything. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to something you said earlier about Neuralink and sort of where we are in transhumanism right now versus where we're going to be when Neuralink eventually happens. What do you see as sort of, if you're a beginning transhumanist or an exploratory one, what do you see as kind of the ways people should dive into us, this? The chip in the arm is quite popular. Um, but what other things do you think that transhumanists can get into now? And what technologies do you see near term coming out that you think are useful? Well, you know, I mean, I like as your viewers know, I have a chip implant in my hand and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's fun. It opens my front door. It can do things like start a car and send a text message and, you know, use it as passwords or keys, and trade Bitcoin, stuff like that. But I think mostly, um, you know, that's one thing to do. They can do some of the neuro, uh, nootropics where they can kind of take some brain drugs and see if that works for them. Mm -hmm. They can play with some of the genetic editing tricks that are out there, some home kits. But, you know, from a transhumanist point of view, it's really only if you're significantly disabled at this moment that you can do something um, sort of elective. Like, obviously, if you've lost your leg in a landmine incident, mm -hmm. you can put on a prosthetic leg and arms can work off the neural system already so you can grab a beer or learn to play piano with a robotic arm. Mm -hmm. But it's really the disabled community that's having the best benefits from transhumanism right now. That said, it's possible within a few years' time, robotic tech, arm, limb technology will get so good that some biohackers, I've heard they might do it soon, will start amputating limbs electively to put on robotic limbs. And, wow. you know, that's really saying, well, how far do you go? Now, I'm, I'm willing to do that myself, but the robotic limb has to be more functional than this limb right here, yeah. than my right, you know, right or left arm. Um, for me to do that, uh, it has to make sense. And we're still, you know, five, 10 years at least away from that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, people might start doing it sooner. So uh, they might do it as soon as 12, 18 months. Uh, I presented last year at a conference that's no longer existing uh, called Body, I think it's the Body Hacking Conference in Austin, Texas. And it was a transhumanist conference. And very much into the, the cyborging thing. And there was a lot of prosthetic limbs that were incredible in terms of what they're able to do. That exoskeleton technology is amazing um, and very promising. Now, um, going just kind of back a step here, if we talked earlier about the idea of the cross-section between the how to live forever discussion and transhumanism, what are some lifestyle habits that you think people should be embracing today in order to get to the point where technology is able to help us get to escape velocity? Well, you know, at this moment, there are a number of drugs you can take, but nothing's really proven. Mm -hmm. uh, it still remains the very best thing is just to don't eat too much and exercise every day, something cardiovascular if you know you have certain genetic issues, try to deal with them with drugs that can help you. I mean, there are some people that take a lot of pills a day. I'm not one of them. I'm only 40, you know, fit 46, but um, I do work out every day and I do try to eat organic foods and stuff like that and not too much meat. I just think um, 
you know, you just have to take care of yourself. A lot of it is a mental state. Um, we are approaching an age when the FDA, though, is probably in the next year or two, there's already been a few approved, will be approving drugs for life extension. There's a number of them in the pipeline. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not 100% sure that they work. Honestly, some people would swear that they work. Others will say, we're not sure yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we're, we're within a year or two, we're probably, I would start taking pills too. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got the do-it-yourself CRISPR kits here, as well as the at-home biological age testing. So I'm looking forward to trying out a few of these synalytics and things that are coming on to market very shortly. Now, uh, so just a couple of things just to round out this this main discussion here around the the politics side of things. Talk to us a little bit about the campaign. I would love to hear more about that. So sure, um, you know, we're on a number of major state ballots before Super Tuesday, which is March 3rd of 2020. So about six, eight weeks away. We're also on the New Hampshire ballot, be participating in the Iowa caucuses, uh, hopefully coming here in, uh, you know, just about two weeks time now, or maybe two and a half weeks. So we're on enough ballots to make a pretty big difference. I would say we have a very little chance to win the nomination against President Trump. Um, mm. However, we are spreading a message of transhumanism. And I like to you know, say that my time running for office might happen in 2028 or 2032 when I run and maybe could win one day. So right now we're just there spreading a message of science, technology, and trying to get Republicans, I'm a Republican candidate, to... Um, embrace science and technology more. They actually have a very bad problem with that. Yeah. It's mostly the Democrats that have been pretty good with that. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm actually running as a Republican is to say, listen, uh, I'm, as an entrepreneur, I have been fiscally conservative. I am dramatically socially liberal and libertarian, but I, you know, I'm happy to say to the Republican party and run for them and say, it's time that your party ends up embracing, uh, how technology is going to affect the human race. It's, you know, the, 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 it, what's happened is, environmentalism is owned by the left mm -hmm. essentially and i don't want transhumanism to be owned by the left i want there to be a balance yeah. i want both the, i think things work off best in the balance i'm not really right or left and i'm not a centrist i'm just somebody who understands that the best way forward is that we as a democracy people put in their input there's good inputs from all sides and i want to make sure that silicon valley and technology the transhumanist movement itself is balanced. And that's really one of the reasons I'm running to try to tell people we need to innovate. We need to out innovate China, which is gaining ground in AI and genetic editing. We need to make sure that transhumanism doesn't turn hard left because it is, it's turning almost socialist. And that's not good for capitalistic markets, in my opinion, at least from a Silicon Valley perspective. And we need to just have some balance out there. We need Republicans to not be so afraid of science and technology, mm -hmm. but rather to say, well, how can we play a part in moving America forward so that we're a transhumanist nation and China doesn't get there first? Because as we mentioned with AI, this is a national security issue too. Getting to be into the transhumanist age doesn't mean just because you're religiously or morally against it, that's to some extent irrelevant if China or Russia get there first. If America wants to remain competitive, we need to stay on the forefront. And as long as we have Republicans in office and in Congress, they need to also embrace that. So that's a lot of my message on these major ballots that I will be on when people start looking into me. And of course, I'm in Texas and California. So those are kind of the two largest states with delegates. So I know that, you know, I'm touring around these states and people are, I'm talking to people. Most people don't find my message very nice. Uh, most people, as we talked about earlier, just like, you know, he's off to some crazy island or they're interested, but only interested in a sense like, it's nice to hear this. Hey, I'm just here to spread a discussion right now, but um, maybe in eight years, I'll be here to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sultan, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. There's a few questions that I like to ask everybody before wrapping up, and you can consider these rapid fire questions. There's six of them. So let's just, let's get cracking. What's your favorite place to vacation? Right now, my favorite place to vacation is uh, Cabo San Lucas in Mexico because I'm a big fan of surfing. Surfing or foiling? Do you like? Uh, sur surfing, just okay. surfing. Surf awesome, awesome. Uh, favorite or book that has had the most impact on you, your life, and how you show up to perform in it? Well, of course, my own book, The Transhumanist Way, <laughs> <done that>, but <laughs> um, because it took so long to write. But really, um, Anne Rand's The Fountainhead, 
Great I book. would say has been the most important in terms of understanding the value of integrity. And in times when people don't want to listen to me on the campaign trail, I'm glad that I have been formed in a way of integrity because it's hard to see ideas that people don't like. Yeah. And the, the story of Howard Vork is pretty incredible. I go back to that book at least once every year. Uh, it's a great one. Me too. Yeah. Me that too. one. And of course the, the one that came after it, Atlas Shrugged, um, significantly shaped the way I think that's for sure. Um, what, uh, what piece of technology have you purchased in the past 12 months that has excited you or significantly elevated your productivity? Who, uh, uh, <laughs> God, you know, I, I gotta say, I'm one of like the worst consumers and I can't even think of anything new that has uh, come into my, uh, my life recently. Uh, and, and I'm so bad because, uh, I don't even have that much technology in my house. We have like small robots and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, that's cool. I mean, talk, talk I guess, to me about the small robot. I want to hear what, what are oh, those? Sure. Yeah. Just so your, your, your audience can see it. It's right there. Uh, uh, but the main thing is that I had a small robot on the 2016 campaign trail when I had my crazy coffin bus, immortality bus driving mm -hmm. across the country and that four foot robot rode shotgun. But I also have two daughters, a nine year old and a five year old. And those, my children grew up with a robot, which is now about five years old. And because it's four feet tall, it's kind of an integral part of their lives. It does about a thousand functions. So that robot's really played an, an amazing kind of a, a emphasis on, on being there with my children. It can teach you to play karate. It can kind of talk to you. It has basic AI, so it can answer things. So the kids, as they were learning language, were able to play with it. So that's really the most fascinating piece of technology I have in my house. It's amazing, though. It's five years old, so it's totally obsolete now. But um, it still is uh, it still is quite fun to play with. You've written books. You've run for president. You're running for president. There, that requires an immense amount of focus. What's your top trick for enhancing focus? I think my top trick is just really working out every day 30 minutes um, and not really ever allowing anything to get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely critical that one – does that because when I run or I jog, I'm no longer able to get onto my computer and I'm just kind of focused on how my brain is operating. And, and it just takes something out of me and gives something back. Mm. And otherwise I'm just like kind of a nervous wreck. And I just, I need, if I don't work out, I kind of go a little bit crazy. I feel like, and not crazy in a bad way, but I feel like that gets my energy levels to where I need. Mm. And so I think, um, I think working out for me has become absolutely critical and just being able to run my daily life. I can't sleep if I don't work out. Well, then how, I, I, maybe you've answered this question in this, uh, in the workout answer, but how do you unwind? So every night I, uh, <laughs> pretty much have a glass of scotch mm -hmm. and, um, oftentimes I will watch a, a documentary a night and I try to make a habit of it. So, cause I started my career for national geographic really for the channel where I was a documentarian. So I just love documentaries. And frankly, there's always enough to watch. So I, I watch as many documentaries as I can. And of course, some great movies, oftentimes geared towards the subjects that I, I, uh, I, I like. So uh, that begs a second question. Favorite documentary of the moment or what comes to mind? Oof. Uh, so just your, 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 uh, your audience knows too, I made my own documentary called Inside the Brutal Cashmere Conflict on one of the conflicts that I, I uh, work for. But you know, uh, in, interestingly enough, and I'm not saying it's my favorite, but I'm gonna just tell you that I recently watched um, the new documentary that's out on the making of the original Star Wars movies. And I find like Star Wars has been so influential in the public sphere that it's really great for me to take a look back and study at the study of how somebody made something so important. And as somebody who's out there trying to sort of lead a movement forward and do these kinds of things, I have um, really take these documentaries that explore how other people have changed the world as, as very important. And um, so I would say, you know, the most favorite documentary right now, just because I've watched it twice, is the, uh, the one on Netflix that shows um, 
actually it's on the Disney channel, uh, Disney plus channel, which just came out is on the original making of the first three star Wars, because how do you take an idea like that and get it to be everybody in the world knows it. Mm -hmm. That's a very special thing. Absolutely. Uh, before the last question, Zoltan, I just want to say thank you so much for well doing what you do because you're pushing questions forward that need to be pushed. And uh, I really appreciate anyone who's willing to take that chance and put themselves out there. So thank you. Um, these are all questions that need to be addressed because if they don't, then we're going to have a big problem soon. So thank you so much for that. Final question, where can people find out more about you, the campaign, and everything that you do? Sure. Well, um, you know, our campaign website is Zoltan2020.com. Mm -hmm. That's Zoltan2020.com. But we also have my own personal site, which is ZoltanEastman.com. And one thing, you know, we didn't talk about, but if your viewers have any questions on any of the topics I've been discussing, like, you know, in the campaign, like artificial wombs or AI or crazy stuff like that, you know, I have written over 200, I think, 25 mainstream media articles, some for the New York Times, some for Vice, some for Newsweek, on any topic. So any topic your listeners might have, just Google my name, uh, you know, and like marriage and transhumanism or something, and you'll probably find a nice one, maybe two articles on it. Mm -hmm. So Googling is sometimes the easiest way to find my work. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll have you back on for a round two on religion of transhumanism, because I know that's a, a topic that you've you've at least linked to before, but yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Please do. I love talking about religion and transhumanism. It's, it's in order for America to move forward. I think a lot of religious people are going to have to embrace somehow a transhumanist point of view mm -hmm. in their view. And of course I have talked a lot, quantum archaeology and a lot of these weird concepts. So yeah, let's do that sometime. That's always a, a fun topic of mine. Absolutely. Zoltan, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've got a busy day full of interviews, but I really appreciate you taking the time to bring us all this education on transhumanism. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an absolutely epic day. All right, guys, what did you think of the show? Do you agree that we should start having these conversations about artificial intelligence, blockchain, universal basic income at a government level? Well, let me know. Send me an email at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. Those of you who've sent emails to that list know that I respond to each and every one. If you like the episode, please share it with your friends, comment on whatever social media channel you're on, or just connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know what you thought. The show notes for this one again are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Zoltan, that's Z-O-L-T-A-N, and have an epic day.